Carl, you've been um, involved with the space program for the last 30 years in a very major way. What do you think are the greatest benefits that have uh, accrued from our expenditures and our exploration of space? There's a huge number of them. Um, one is uh, satellite communications. I mean, the, this conversation is uh, being broadcast uh, all, over all over the world largely via communication satellites. They sit up there, they go around the Earth as fast as the Earth rotates, so they hover over one spot, and so you can send a message to one of them, and back it comes down to a different part of the Earth, and it binds the Earth together. It's a very powerful political fact that there's a different way from what we were talking about before, in which technology is binding the Earth together. Another uh, aspect that I think is tremendously important is those photographs of the Earth alone in space, fragile, blue world, in this vast blackness, this vacuum, velvety vacuum of space. And it's, it's clear, it's a very thin atmosphere. It's so sensitive to the depredations of human beings. You look at that and you say, hey, that's only one little world. We don't have anywhere else to go. No other planet in the solar system is a suitable home for human beings. It's this world or nothing. That's a very powerful perception. Uh, then, in, in the particular field that, I, uh, that I'm involved with, uh, the exploration of planets, by, usually by robotic spacecraft, uh, there we have opened up a, a universe of wonders. We have looked close up at uh, dozens of new worlds, worlds that we never saw before. And uh, unless we're so stupid as to destroy ourselves, there are going to be people exploring those worlds. There are going to be human habitations on those worlds. We're going to be moving out into space in the next century. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to have played a role in the first preliminary reconnaissance of the solar system. That's a terrifically exciting thing. Then there's the fact that uh, when you study these other worlds, you learn about this one. It's a very important fact. If you look at uh, the individuals who played key roles in uh, discovering the uh, threat to the ozone layer, the increasing greenhouse effect, nuclear winter, you find a very high uh, preponderance of planetary scientists uh, working in there. People have cut their teeth on other worlds and then come back to examine this one. By comparing our world with other worlds, you can see a lot of things that can go wrong. Venus, for example, has this immense greenhouse effect. Surface temperature is hot enough to melt uh, tin or lead. Anybody who says the greenhouse effect is, uh, is just some fantasy all I have to do is look at Venus, a very important object lesson. And then there's one more, there are a lot more, but there's one more in particular uh, kind of uh, advantage of space exploration that uh, I would stress, and, uh, or of, of space technology, and that is military reconnaissance and treaty verification satellites. If you don't know what the other side is doing, then the standard uh, military prudence is to assume the worst, the worst case. That means you then build up your armaments for the worst that they possibly could do. They see that you're doing some of that, they do the same, and you have a nuclear arms race which is absolutely catastrophic with our present technology. The satellites tell you what's actually happening there to remarkably high fidelity, so it calms the hotheads and paranoids on both sides, and that's worth its weight in gold. So put all that together, plus weather satellites, they save billions of dollars in, uh, in crops every year just from knowing what, what bad weather is happening so farmers can take precautions. Um, the space program has paid for itself many times over and uh, none of this, of course, has to do with putting people up into space. There may be good reasons for doing that, historical reasons, uh, social reasons, reasons for building bridges with other countries. I'm, for example, a strong advocate for uh, a long-term joint U.S.-Soviet program to put Americans and Russians on Mars. Uh, I think that would be wonderful for, for uh, joining the two countries together in a grand common endeavor on behalf of the human species, benign, high technology, reaching out to the next century. Um, uh, and there are many other still unrealized practical applications of uh, the space program. We've not given it nearly the attention it deserves, and especially in the last 10 or 15 years. The United States uh, has been awful. Since 1978, the U.S., which led, pioneered the exploration of the solar system, has not launched one spacecraft to the moon or planets in more than a decade. 
We have not launched one. We hope that there will be uh, shortly, later, later this year, uh, the end of that, of that drought. But uh, we have let the space program uh, languish in the last 10 or 15 years as we have let all sorts of social programs languish, as we have permitted uh, uh, the amount of poverty in children to increase. Before the end of this century, more than half the kids in America may be below the poverty line. What kind of a future do we build for the country if we raise all these kids as disadvantaged, as unable to cope with the society, as resentful for the injustice served up to them. This is stupid. And then what happened with the resources is they, they went into increasing uh, budgets for arms. Isn't that uh, where, the, where, the money, where the money went? That and making rich people richer. Those are the two places. Well, the thing about money. rich people, and being one, I guess, <laughs> uh, is, is the money all gets reinvested. If you've got money, you put it in a bank. The bank lends it out to uh, people to buy homes or cars but, or but whatever. But not poor gets, people. But not poor people. Well, that's a good it point. It tends to stay up at that highly stratified, very... Well, more people get employed with capital uh, formation and so forth. Are you a socialist? Uh, I'm not sure what a socialist is, well, but, I I believe that the, but I believe that the government has a responsibility to care for the people. I'm not talking about dole. I'm talking about making people self-reliant, people able to take care of themselves. There are countries which are perfectly able to do that. The United States is an extremely rich country. It's perfectly able to do that. It chooses not to. It chooses to have homeless people. It chooses... It's, we are 19th in the world in infant mortality. 18 other countries save the lives of their babies better than we. How come? They just spend more money on it. They care about their babies more than we care about ours. I think it's a disgrace. And uh, this country has vast... Wealth. You just look at what something like uh, Star Wars, the money spent on Star Wars, already spent $20 billion on it. If these guys are permitted to go ahead, they will spend a trillion dollars on Star Wars. Think of what that money could be used for to educate, to help, to bring people up to a sense of, of uh, self-confidence, to improve not just the happiness of people in America, but their economic standing, to improve the competitiveness of the United States compared to other countries. We are using money for the wrong stuff. Carl, do you think time travel's possible? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we all are time travelers. I mean, we travel into the future one year at a time. <laughs> it takes a year to do it. Um, uh, according to uh, Einstein's special relativity, which is uh, a description of the way the world works, I mean, it's, it's true, uh, you can travel as far into the future as you want uh, if only you travel close enough to the speed of light. You can't travel at the speed of light, you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but there's nothing in physics that prevents you from traveling at, you know, 0.999, uh, 0.999 the speed of light. Uh, and then time for you slows down. And so you could travel a million years into the future. And... Uh, and be perfectly okay. The question is, could you ever get back? And there is the, is the present debate. Can you go backwards in time? Is it permitted by physics? Never mind, do we have the technology? Obviously, we don't have the technology. An interesting thing has happened uh, lately. I, uh, I, I wrote a few years ago a novel called uh, Contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, I tried to, uh, to imagine a uh, physically reasonable way to go quickly to some, some distant place. Uh, without traveling close to the speed of light. And I asked a friend of mine, Kip Thorne, who's a uh, specialist in gravitation theory at uh, Caltech, to uh, tell me the best way to do it. And that got him working with uh, some of his students. And so they uh, developed a uh, most interesting theory of wormholes, so-called uh, sort of quick paths through space-time, uh, that seem to be permitted by the laws of physics, although it would require a very high advanced technology, much more advanced than us, to do it. A part of that is that uh, time travel seems to be feasible. And uh, so it is barely conceivable that a very advanced civilization might be able to travel both into their far future and into their past. Uh, it raises all kinds of funny causality problems. What happens if you go back in time, kill your grandparents before they gave birth to your parents, then are you alive or dead? What does it mean? Uh, these, are, these are called causality problems, and uh, they are very puzzling. So I would not say we understand this issue, but there's been some most interesting uh, uh, progress recently because of the work of, uh, of Kip Thorne.